Well, thank you very much, Ulrich. Good morning, everyone. <coughs> Indeed, I will stressing, I'm going to stress today a few aspects of prevention, which probably have some influence on some of the political decisions in uh, prevention as well. Uh, if, if I just document it in the first slide, it shows at this moment the steady increase in cancer incidence globally and at the same time the decrease in mortality as well for males and females as far as the general uh, rate of cancer is concerned. And we can roughly calculate that this is going on in the future. And as I said yesterday, there's not really a balance between the two uh, aspects, incidence and mortality. So if you really wish to do something against cancer, it will be important to reduce the incidence in these cases. Now, could you move it or it doesn't move here? Yeah. Oh, sorry. No, I made a mistake. I looked it to my own computer. Sorry for that. Okay. Now, <clears throat> we do know at present a large number of uh, cancers, approximately 20% of the global cancer incidents, which are linked to infection. And the identification of those types of infection had some impact already on prevention, particularly as far as hepatitis B virus, but also papilloma viruses are concerned where vaccination are available. But in addition, there are various modes of treatment at this moment. Think of AIDS infection, the HIV infections, but also in the, for the treatment of, of uh, schistosomiasis, of uh, uh, Helicobacter pylori and also of hepatitis C, which will have some impact on cancer incidence. So the identification was important. There's one other aspect which deserves to be mentioned here, that is that most of these cancers have a very long latency period between infection and the development of cancer. It usually takes at least a couple of years, in most instances, up to decades before cancer develops. And we do know today that none of the infection-linked cancers is by itself sufficient to cause cancer, but you always need some additional mutations in host cell genomes besides the uptake of the genomes, besides in some instances specific functions of the genome in order to uh, uh, have a full development of cancer in these instances. The next one, please. Could I get the next one, please? doesn't work. It should be, but it doesn't. Okay. <coughs> this one, yes. Okay, that's fine, yes, all right. Perfect, it's now, please go. Okay, we, we do know, okay. no, that's not the next one, there was another one in between. Before that? No. That's okay. Let's, let's leave it. Uh, we do know basically two modes of, go back one more. We do know right now uh, two modes of how uh, infections interact in order to lead to cancer. And that is, in some instances, you requ we require the persistence of the viral genomes in the cells and specific functions of the viral genomes. Go back. Go back, please. Yeah, back. Yeah, back specific functions of the viral genomes. One more back. One more back. Okay. Specific functions of the viral genome which lead to, to cancer development. But we can roughly differentiate the two major modes. One is the persistence of the viral genome, the other is indirect function by which specific types of uh, infections lead to mutagenic events or induce mutagenesis via the induction of oxygen radicals. We do know it from parasitic infections, we do know it from bacterial infections, and we also know it from hepatitis C virus infections, where in, uh, this type of indirect mode plays an important role. So yet, in spite of the fact that during the past decades, two decades in particular, a large number of human cancers have been identified, completely sequenced, and the genome, uh, an genomes analyzed for the presence of foreign sequences. Since the year 2008, when the Merkel polyoma virus has been discovered, there was not a single additional agent which has been convincingly demonstrated to play a role in human cancers. So this has obviously two types of consequences, namely, <coughs> first of all, that we possibly know all 
infectious agents which are linked to cancer. Or the other aspect is that the involvement of infectious agents does not follow the pattern of well-established oncogenic pathogens. And we, during the past 20 years, in fact, uh, directly after a visit to Stockholm uh, in 2008, we started to work instantly on these aspects, so looking to alternative possibilities. When I say we, that's in particular my wife, who is here right now as well, uh, and I, we looked into uh, different modes of possible interactions in these instances. Next one, yes. The, uh, what was striking us was the question on colon cancer. There are some epidemiological factors which looked quite intriguing. Namely, first of all, that there was a linkage between the red meat consumption and colon cancer. It's listed here on the slide. Countries with the highest rate of red meat consumption uh, are usually countries which commonly reveal a high rate of colon cancer. By the way, as we will hear it later on as well, also for breast cancer. They're widely linked to uh, at least to some cattle product, I should say. For a long period of time, it was almost quite clear that this is due to chemical carcinogens which are produced during broiling, roasting, frying, barbecuing, and curing. And uh, this sounded very convincing when in 1978, Sugimura in Japan isolated those substances, found that aromatic hydrocarbons are indeed carcinogenic if you give them to rodents. They produce cancers in various organs, in fact, not only in the colon. Uh, and it looked, at least for a majority of epidemiologists, as a very convincing evidence that this is a factor which leads to colon cancer. If one looks more carefully into the next one, please. If one looks very carefully into the uh, situation of colon cancer, the red meat consumption, then something was striking us. Namely, first of all, the dark areas here on this slide indicate those areas where colon cancer is quite prevalent. And these are all the areas globally where a specific type of cattle is being bred, namely the Eurasian type of dairy cattle which is being kept. Whereas in other countries, take India in particular, Mongolia, quite interestingly, and also Bolivia or equatorial Africa have a very low rate of this cancer and also of colon cancer. Well, this looked to us like a kind of a species-specific effect which might play a significant role. And if it is a species-specific effect, then as being trained as a virologist, it was not far-fetched to assume that it might be linked to some kind of, of infections here. Infections which are carried by one species of cattle, genetically different from all the other types of cattle which are listed here as well, uh, and other types of red meat uh, at the same time. Next slide, please. So uh, we tried really for that reason to look into meat, the serum of cattle, particularly of our dairy cattle, and also to of uh, milk, uh, besides milk products, also the serum of, of the, uh, this cattle. And in fact, this analysis turned out to be quite interesting. Because first of all, we isolated, and I said we, it's, it's really, again, my wife who was quite instrumental in doing this. Uh, we isolated a large number of single-stranded circular DNAs of small size, which showed, interestingly, a remarkable similarity to bacterial, specific bacterial plasmids. They were not identical to bacterial plasmids, but they were very similar to bacterial plasmids. And this is a very specific subgroup of plasmids among the vast, wide variety of plasmids which are anyway in bacteria, and it's a specific type of bacteria, namely Acinotobacter baumannii, which was really the one which was quite prevalent. So we characterized them into four different groups of isolates. Uh, namely those which were called BMMF, bovine meat and milk factors, because they were isolated from serum, and we assumed if something is in the serum, it must be also in the, in the meat, and, uh, and many of them have been isolated directly from milk of, from the supermarkets around Heidelberg, and by now also from a few other places. Uh, the groups is uh, in a bit heterogeneous, also the group one, what we call BMMF1, uh, shares some similarity, because one major protein, which is an open reading frame, which is present, is uh, preserved in the, during the, in the whole group. The group two, we have now approximately 20 members of that group. Group two is even more heterogeneous. And so they comprise at this moment, uh, as Michel analyzed them, about 100 different, uh, about 100 different isolates, which share some similarities, but in part are also quite different. <coughs> 
But as I said before, all of them have some, some similarity, in some instances almost a striking similarity to bacterial plasmids, but they're not identical to those. Now, it was of course an interesting question, particularly in view of the similarity of two plasmids, uh, to see whether they have anything to do with human cells. Uh, before doing this, let's go back uh, one moment again to the previous one. Go back. Okay. Uh, it was interesting that we isolated instantly or already in the first attempts. Two of these plasmids indicated here with red arrows in the upper part of the picture from, multiple, from a multiple sclerosis biopsy. So these were isolates quite similar to those in, in bovine, of the bovine isolates, but they came from a multiple sclerosis patient. Uh, a couple of others which I'm not going to discuss today, the gimme circular viruses and the fourth group of, of fact, a factor uh, were also isolated in part from human sources. The GMI circular viruses are known to be infections occurring from time to time in humans as well. Now, this interested us very much, it interests us very much to analyze the question whether these are infections, can these isolates infect human cells or not? Next one, please. And uh, indeed, the tests which have been done with some of the isolates, not with all of them, which we have so far clearly indicated, they are, first of all, they are genetically active in specific human cells. And secondly, they also express proteins in specific human cells, which could be neatly demonstrated, as I said before, not for all of them, not all of them have been tested by now, but those which have been tested clearly were active in human cells. Uh, the interesting question was, do they replicate in human cells? And uh, this was not true for all kinds of human cells which have been tested, but we found specific types of human cells in which we actively replicated. That was first of all in uh, Hodgkin lymphoma cells, which cell lines for Hodgkin lymphoma uh, patients, and also in specific lines of uh, B cell origin. And as you can see it here, for instance, for a period of 36 days in the upper band there, there is indeed an active replication and even the formation of some defective small molecules which correspond to part of the open reading frame which uh, I mentioned a moment ago. So replication is taking place. Uh, the question in which we, whether they produce infectious progeny is, was difficult to tackle and I will t uh, tell you a little bit later why it was not very easy. But uh, before doing this, let me say a few things which uh, came along this, this way and which we found extremely interesting. It's known since quite a long time that prolonged breastfeeding is a, has a preventive effect and a protective effect for several infections. And some of them are listed here. Some of them are very well studied, in particular diarrhea and respiratory tract infections, rotavirus, norovirus infections, human polyoma virus type 9, very, very intensively studied in that respect. Candida albicans, specific type of fiber virus, even strains of influenza A virus, and even other conditions are they are more rarely appearing in those instances where prolonged breast, breastfeeding is taking place, namely type 1 and type 2 diabetes and inflammatory bowel disease. We found that very interesting and we do know by now what is the reason for this protective effect, namely in the, in the breast in, in the milk of humans, we have specific types of sugars, next one please, which have been very well characterized as the two prime and three prime fucosyl lactose and the tetraose, which bind to receptors in the human cell membranes, and they block the receptors for those types of infection, which I showed you a moment ago. So in fact, these sugars have a protective effect. These sugars are not present in cow milk, in cow milk derivatives. Cow milk also contains some types of sugars, but they are different and they protect young calves against some deleterious infections at an early age of those animals. So this is a, in the course of evolution something which is specifically developed here. And uh, there's something else happening when you, when you wean the babies and when uh, the children are fed with cow milk products in particular, namely they pick up another type of neuraminic acid in fact, that's the so-called N-glucolineuraminic acid, I call it NOI5GC in the, in the future. 
uh, which cannot be formed in humans, in, in spite of the fact that the, uh, that the molecule from which this is derived in animals, the N-acetylneuraminic acid, is present in humans, but we have a defect in the enzyme which converts this NIL5AC into NIL5GC, and this we have in common with chicken, interestingly, not with other animals. All the other animals do it. Now, the uh, uh, NIL5GC becomes incorporated into the membranes of the cells, like the other types of sugars which are protective, which I mentioned a moment ago, and uh, it changes the properties of these types of receptors. They are now sus becoming susceptible to some agents, the those which I showed before, against them were not susceptible during the period of breast feeding. The interesting part is here that there's an additional protective effect of prolonged breast feeding also for some tumors, Hodgkin's disease, non-Hodgkin lymphomas, acute lymphatic leukemias, and even uh, uh, multiple sclerosis has been described as that prolonged breastfeeding is effective. There are fortunately some statistics available about the duration of breastfeeding in, from 153 countries, and here the dark areas indicate those where prolonged breastfeeding is customary, usually 12 months or even more and longer. And you see it here, for instance, for Mongolia, you see it for India, you see it for Equatorial Africa, and also for Bolivia. They indicated as countries with a very high period of breastfeeding. You see the same countries here indicated in this chart for colon cancer and breast cancer. They are low incidence countries for those types of countries. This doesn't prove anything, but it's quite interesting as a kind of correlation which exists in these cases. So that seems to stress the importance of dairy factors as risks for specific cancers and the countries with the highest rate, as I said before, commonly will be low rates of colon and breast cancers. Conversely, countries with the lowest rate exhibit higher rates of colon and breast cancer. There was a Swedish study by G. Sundqvist and Sundqvist showing that lactose intolerant siblings have a low rate, have a, uh, a, a, a protection against certain types of cancer, in particular breast and also colon cancer, under those circumstances, but also ovarian cancer. And this was a large-scale study on the Swedish cancer registries, studying about 23,000 lactose intolerant persons and comparing them to 70,000 siblings and uh, in the sa of the same families. Quite interesting as well. So the well-established protective effect of breastfeeding for newborn babies, which has been established in quite a large number of uh, different studies all over the world, raises an important question. Do the sugars reported to cause these effects in neonates, do they also protect the breastfeeding mothers? That's an interesting point which we started to look into the literature. And indeed, there are some data available which clearly shows this. A large set of data are really available that indeed multiparous women as shown here in a study of 122,000 multiparous women, uh, have a protective effect at least against breast, uh, breast cancer. It was shown here, which comes down to something like 36 to 50 percent. In some other studies, even above 50 percent of these are usually uh, case control studies, so they're probably not as valid as these studies as which are shown here. And the protective effect has also been studied for endometrial cancer, for colon cancer, for lung cancer, interestingly, as well, and also for ovarian cancer. So it seems to be a relatively widespread phenomenon. This is a schematic view of what is happening. Indeed, the sugars are produced in the breast of the breastfeeding mothers. They are excreted also in the urine of these mothers, so they must be also present in the blood of the respective person. And uh, the upper part of this picture shows a schematic view during repeated pregnancies and deliveries and breastfeeding periods. In the shaded part where the sugars are occurring, they are no longer produced after stopping breastfeeding later on. Um, so that was the reason we developed a large number of monoclonal antibodies against the major protein, particularly against this one isolate which we obtained from a patient with um, multiple sclerosis, but we also developed a few which cover also the others. And of course, with the aid of Timo Bunt on the left-hand part of the picture, he did the development of the monoclonal antibodies. And with the aid of the pathologists and the epidemiologists shown here on the slide, we obtained a large number of sections material from colon cancer, normal material, but also colon cancer material. This shows a normal part of a, of a colon cancer patient. And the interesting part was with various 
monoclonal antibodies staining different epitopes of the same protein, of the so-called red protein here, we get the same type of staining pattern under those circumstances. You see the heavily stained area, which surprisingly was not in the area where the breast cancer develops from. These are the Libocrine scripts, which you see the circular structures there, which are the progenitor cells of, of uh, colon cancer. And under those circumstances, uh, we basically saw no occasionally one suspected cell or so which was stained, but basically they're not stained, but pericryptal tissue was heavily stained under those circumstances in many of the instances. And uh, by analyzing uh, more of them and by looking more carefully into the situation, the lower part of this picture, the next one, please. Go ahead. The lower part of this picture shows to the left side the staining with monoclonal antibodies and the same part staining for inflammatory reactions, namely for CD68 uh, macrophage invasion and inflammatory reactions under those circumstances. The same regions in many, in virtually all instances which have been tested, corresponded, corresponded with each other. And on the upper part of this picture, you see the, the replication in the crypt tissue the lower part of the crypt in the upper right tangential sections of the crypts, you see that the lower part and the medium part of the crypt show the heavy indication of replication of cells, whereas the upper part is differentiated and does no longer replicate. So uh, this is the other the tangent, uh, um, traverse section of the crypts. But well, I'm taking a little bit more time and we'll go on. So we s subsequently studied the fact whether there's an induction of uh, oxygen radicals due to these infections, and indeed, as we could demonstrate, this is not a demonstration of it, but it comes out in a kind of schematic view, the, uh, the stars here in, indicated just arbitrarily in this picture, but we have some pictures which clearly showed also uh, the staining of the 2-hydroxy uh, uh, guanosine under those circumstances, indication for, for an activity of uh, oxygen radicals. And uh, so in, it instantly raised the suspicion that the cells, which are eventually the target cells for colon cancer, are not the ones which contain this agent, but they are affected by the, uh, oxy by the mutational events due to the, uh, due to the uh, uh, inflammatory reactions, and that particularly proliferating cells are very readily fixing the mutations under those circumstances in these cases. Now, <coughs> this shows an array of various, the next one, shows an array of various types of, of uh, could you go on? One more, please. Okay, this shows uh, the, um, of normal tissue, and, and the lower part shows the corresponding cancer tissue of the same persons, and you see in the cancer there's very little, if any, staining, but in the normal part, besides the cancer of lesions, there are the active staining. We have even evidence right now which is still not fully, uh, uh, these studies are not fully completed, that the intensity of the staining has something to do with the survival time of the patient of, of colon cancer, uh, which probably indicates, is an indication for the multi, multiplicity of uh, mutations which are taking place. There's still another aspect which found our interest, namely, there's since a long time known that anti-inflammatory drugs have a protective effect against colon cancer in particular, and that is particularly true for aspirin, for ibuprofen, for uh, COX-2 inhibitors, and a couple of others which are listed here. There was a meta-analysis conducted by Harrison and his colleagues of 91 epidemiological studies, and this came to a conclusion that there's a protection in about 63% for colon cancer of 39% for breast cancer, 36% of lung, lung cancer, and 39% of prostate cancer, and also a couple of other risk reduction uh, observed for esophageal, stomach, and also ovarian cancer. Now, this we found quite interesting because it stressed the fact that if the inflammation is blocked, then you have a protective effect for this type of cancer. And inflammations around this type of cancer are known since a long time, have been studied even in some detail, and that is uh, quite conventional. It seems to be true for breast cancer as well. In fact, we obtained for staining almost the same pattern for breast cancer 
as for colon cancer. We have not done the same number of studies in breast cancer as for colon cancer, but the situation looks quite analogous. And we see already right now that the inflammatory lesions in prostate cancer look quite similar to colon and breast cancer, but that has not been studied, but we just obtained the samples in order to analyze it now, but we suspect strongly that there's a similar situation for colon cancer. So what we believe here to find, uh, that we have found, these are zoonotic infections occurring during the first, possibly even up to the second year of life, and they emerge as the main risk factors for specific cancers, and which I am not going to discuss here right now for chronic neurological disease, particularly for multiple sclerosis, for Parkinson's disease, and Alzheimer's disease, where we always found some staining of the same antibodies in the respective tissue. They're possibly linked to other autoimmune diseases and early inflammatory uh, events in atherosclerosis. So it's an interesting topic. They seem to be all to be due to the induction of slow chronic inflammations going on for decades and lead in the case of cancers four to seven decades later to the respective form of, of cancer. Now, these agents obviously represent a novel class of human pathogens, obviously derived from bacterial plasmids somehow in our evolution, co-evolution, with the consumption of dairy products and uh, meat of, of cattle. We cannot calculate at the moment when this type of jump happened. The plasmids are quite similar, but they're not identical with the plasmids found in the bacteria, but uh, some, some uh, uh, differences visible, also some are very closely related to these plasmids. And uh, so they develop after long periods of time. These agents represent, in our opinion, a novel class of human pathogens, obviously derived from bacterial plasmids, adapted to independent replication and infection of mammalian cells, the mode of infection is still not completely clear. We do not know whether it's it obviously requires some new 5GC containing receptors, but we do not know at this stage whether it's an infectious event similar to a virus infection, binding to the receptor and being engulfed and so on, or whether it is an infection like a bacterial type of conjugation of the respective types of, uh, of agents to human cells, or where there's possibly also microvesical transmission, mode of transmission, which needs to be uh, established. Uh, so it's, it's in, they have an independent replication and infection of the human cells, and they are linked to several types of diseases. We like to call them plasmidosis as a, a term because they obviously derive from plasmids, and here are two for, for diseases which are not known which are initiated by not known factors at this moment, and we believe that this has a clear impact for quite a couple of ca uh, cancers. This is a kind of a complicated scheme showing what we assume is the, is the uh, basis for these types of cancers, a post scheme. You see here the, the origin is obviously in many instances of bovine. We do not know whether ang other angulites do the same, most likely not, but we have no real evidence for this so far. We see that the primary target of these infections are mesenchymal cells of the colon, the lamina propria of the colon. Uh, this seems to occur in the first year of life after the weaning period in those instances. And <coughs> subsequently, an invasion of macrophages and chronic inflammation takes place, interestingly, without a significant addition of T and B cells under those circumstances. Uh, which may reflect a kind of an, of an immunotolerant phenomenon in these instances, similar to hepatitis B virus infections, but we have at this moment no clear-cut view how this is happening. The slow induction of uh, oxygen nitrogen radicals, which we can demonstrate right now, the random mutations in adjacent proliferating cells by these specific triggers, and precursor lesions develop subsequently. We find, by the way, the same in uh, colon, po colonic polyps as we do find it in, in uh, malignant tissues. And we can explain the, the uh, inhibitory effect of, uh, of non-inflammatory, uh, non-steroidal drugs. We uh, do, can easily explain the in inherited mutations that they add to the risk of developing cancers. For instance, BRCA1 or BRCA1, they were clearly, uh, two, 
They will clearly enhance the malignant conversion at earlier ages as well. We can explain the uh, synergistic contributions of other mutagenic factors as well, although they seem to be, play a very limited role. And we understand why chicken meat is safe, as it is called, because it doesn't contain the respective receptor molecules. And we can also state why fish is safer, because the receptors in fish are usually highly rearranged types of, of molecules, which have some similarities with new 5CC, world, but are not identical under those circumstances as well. So uh, it's the interesting part here is, in our view, that uh, if we take it for, if we would take it for granted that breast cancer, colorectal cancer, and prostate cancer are linked to these types of infections, we can roughly calculate that 30% of the human, total human cancer, global cancer incidence is linked to these types of infections, and that clearly deserves uh, confirmation in other groups and so on, and uh, which would bring up the rate of cancers linked to infections to more than 50% at this stage. So it is really an important issue, and of course it opens new ways for the prevention of, of these types of cancer, because clearly if we know the neutralizing factors for those types of agents, they are open for vaccination probably at a very early age in the baby period, namely during, before weaning of the babies, similar as it is done in East Asia for hepatitis B virus infection. Uh, next one, oh, this, these are, go back please. Go back? Yes. yes. Next one, no. You oriented yourself too much on this, on my own slides. Okay, so these are the people who contribute greatly uh, to uh, the whole story. Uh, the, uh, Pathologist there on the left, a pediatrician, uh, Wolfram Scholzer in Nuremberg and also in Sweden, uh, Hans Olaf, uh, Thomas Olsen and Hans Grönland, uh, who helped us very much with the multiple sclerosis here. What I didn't mention is we have now significantly elevated titers in ELISA tests for multiple sclerosis, Parkinson's disease, and also Alzheimer's disease, and we have reduced titers reduced titers in colon cancer and in breast cancers, at least so far as we have tested it. And that again stresses the fact that the prenatal infection leads to a specific mode of immunotolerance under those circumstances, but this clearly needs, uh, requires further investigations under those circumstances. Next one, I think is the last one. Is there one more? No. Okay. Well, so in, in summary, uh, what we find quite striking is that we, there is a novel class. Uh, you may ask the question, why has it not been identified before in the total sequences, sequencing of human cancers? The answer is a simple one. It's usually thrown out as a bacterial contamination uh, because they have the similarity to bacterial uh, sequences. There's no doubt about it. We, wouldn't, we would have probably done the same if uh, we didn't have to work particularly as a Michelle again on TT viruses which provided us with a technology to get quickly hold of those types of sequences, which we found interesting after infecting human cells with them, transfecting human cells with them. So on the whole, it's, it's a story which probably has some impact for future preventive activities and for really, uh, hopefully, reducing the risk for <coughs> some of the very common human cancers. Thank you very much. <laughs>